so, you know, just I just want to reiterate, and this is something I was just talking to my wife about, Sandy, and I want the audience to really understand this. Black people don't really know how bad off they have it. They think because they work with a white person uh, 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 and vice versa, white people work with black people and they got similar shoes. Or, hey, the black guy might have a nicer car with better rims. Uh, yeah. he, may dr- he may have better well, titties. Well, we, we do have better taste. I mean, you know, that's a question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a given. I'm Tim Black, you know. But, but when it breaks down, I don't own my home. Uh, and if I do, I'm refinanced three times. Right. Um, my, my grandmother, she's in a nursing home. My brother's unemployed. My cousin's unemployed. My sister's underemployed. These, this is the reality. And meanwhile, right. that white family who's driving the old uh, Hyundai hatchback, um, they, they got two houses in the family. Grandma has some land down in the Carolinas. Their uncle has a business that's been in the family for three generations. And the list goes on. So j- people don't tell you their status and you just think, it's normal what you have, and everyone has what you have, but there's a big, there's a gulf there's between a, there's the two. A, there's a vast gulf. There's a vast gulf. I, and I would add that if we think about business activity or business ownership, it really does give us a, a, a deeper sense of how vast that gulf is. If we were to take all of the Black businesses collectively, and there's probably about two and a half million Black-owned businesses in the United States. Maybe the figure is a little bit higher. But if we were to take all of those businesses and look at their combined sales revenue, their combined sales revenue would be approximately one-third of the sales revenue of Walmart taken alone. Okay. So if people are thinking that the way in which we're going to close the racial wealth gap is by extending or expanding black businesses, given our existing resources, then that's a fantasy. Got it. Got it. That's very sobering. Very sobering. So, uh, Sandy, you got me. I understand black people are behind. Um, How are reparations? But but I want to emphasize, we're not behind because we do stupid things or we're dysfunctional. Oh, I thought it was because of the, 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 the Air Jordans we like to buy. Uh, right, right, right. You know, you know. Actually, it's interesting. Uh, you know, people presume that black folks are are big spenders uh, and bigger spenders than white folks. But but if you look carefully at the data uh, about household spending patterns, and you look at households where there's a similar level of income between black and white households, actually, white households spend 1.3 times as much as as black households households with comparable levels of income. And the, and the reason they're able to do that is because their wealth position is so much stronger. Uh, and so uh, so it's not at all the case that black people are, are more prone to spend than white folks. We might buy different things, right. uh, but we actually have a very similar savings rate to white folks. And in some income categories, we have a higher savings rate. And that's despite the fact that we have to contend with the issue that you raised earlier, which is if if we have more of a middle income, uh, we, if we have more of a middle income, we probably have more responsibilities or obligations to support relatives who don't have many resources. Uh, nonetheless, we still save at a rate that's similar to whites out of any given level of income. That's so important to note uh, because there is that there is that negative stereotype that people I don't know where to get it from, but this idea that we just waste our opportunity that yeah. it's the Asian community they they're just so much more frugal uh, yeah. than you and yeah. you need to you need to save more and this is a situation uh, that's brought on yourself. So like, like I said, I want to I want to kind of move on because. I think unless you're a person who's actually just big at it, I'm just going to keep it real, Sandy. Unless a person's big at it, um, they're going to have to come to a conclusion that, okay, black people are not doing as well as white people. And and, and there is there's uh, historical references and reasons for that, deliberate actions, things that were done via the government um, that created this situation, slavery, Jim Crow. Yeah. These are not your average person. I want people to know, we're not talking about an irate white woman in the parking lot of CVS using the N-word. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about generation upon generation being unable to accumulate wealth. That's what yeah. the doctor's talking about. So please, let's let's make sure we're on the right page. So, um, yeah, and I think I think a key thing is what you said, generational. 
This yes. is a multi-generational property pro- process of deprivation and denial of wealth. And, uh, and uh, if, if you think about it, if you go back to uh, 1865, where there was an unmet promise of 40 acres that were supposed to be delivered to the formerly enslaved folks, and that promise was never fulfilled, I, I think that's the beginning of the racial wealth gap in the United States. Uh, we might not even be having a conversation about reparations had the 40-acre land grants been delivered to the formerly enslaved. And so, uh, so that, that's, that's kind of the cornerstone of this whole process of wealth denial and wealth stripping. Um, if, if, uh, the black, uh, if the formerly enslaved had received the 40-acre land grants, then that would have amounted to at least a total of 40 million acres that should have gone to black Americans. Uh, in the aftermath of the Reconstruction era, and in the aftermath of a period in which the promised land grants never were actually uh, delivered, uh, or if they were initially delivered, the, the land was taken away and given back to the former slaveholders. In the aftermath of that, up until the early part of the 20th century, Blacks somehow managed to accumulate 15 million acres of land, primarily in the South. That's 25 million acres less than the 40 million figure, but it was a pretty extraordinary accomplishment, particularly given the circumstances and conditions our people were confronted with. And so, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, uh, what 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 is tragic about that process is that progressively that 15 million acres of land was essentially taken from black folks through theft, through seizure, through other forms of appropriation that appeared to be semi-legal. Uh, so that the net effect was once you got into the 1970s and 1980s, black folks typically did not own any more than a total of about 1 million acres of land in the United States. Uh, So there's a whole process of loss of wealth that we have to be cognizant of, and it's a loss of wealth that occurred under conditions of violence and force. Um, While we're we're having that conversation, I want to kind of move things just a little bit into the H.R. 40, because people are saying that this is going to be a part of the mechanism in which to correct this situation. They said, OK, we need to we need to go through this study first and we can determine if we, if we agree that reparations should be done or maybe it can be done. or What does that look like? So how does H.R. 40 play into this idea that, OK, black people are finally going to be given some type of equity or some type of equal equal footing with white families? So uh, let me say two things. One, I believe H.R. 40 or a commission that would be activated by H.R. 40 is necessary. Uh, But the second thing is I want to say is I don't think that the wording of the legislation that currently is in place is adequate. I think that the, the law as it's currently written needs to be rewritten. But, uh, but uh, why do I think it's important to actually have such a commission? Uh, I don't think that having such a commission is a deflection from activating a full and comprehensive reparations program. Uh, <laughs> I think it's essential because if we think about the history of other kinds of reparations initiatives, particularly in the United States, uh, they usually were preceded by some form of a commission that did two things, made the historical case for why the reparations program was appropriate for that particular community, and also set up the terms of a program of restitution that could be translated into legislation. Uh, a key example is the reparations program that was inaugurated on behalf of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. Uh, that program was preceded by a congressional commission that was called the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And that commission generated a report that set the record straight. And, And the important aspect of what was set straight in the record was the, uh, 
was the demonstration that American officials knew that the Japanese American community was not a security threat, mm -hmm. but still proceeded to put them in these various kinds of concentration camps around the country. Um, the second thing that report did was it provided a plan of restitution. And so I think that in parallel fashion, that's what we should want and expect from a commission that would be activated to address the historical trajectory of racial injustice in the United States. Okay, uh, right there, right there, doctor, not to interrupt you, but I, yeah. I, gotta break, I gotta break this in pieces for people. So what Dr. Darity just said there, and please correct me once again if I'm wrong, but the commission, so our goal with this, with this content right here is not to lay out the total case for reparations. The commission, the HR 40 makes a commission that will lay out why reparations make sense and yeah. then how we can be implemented. How so, we can go about, how we can implement an actual program. That's what the commission should do. And I think that the legislation has to be written in such a way that it ensures that that is what the commission does. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't think that the legislation as it's currently written mm -hmm. guarantees that that will be the case. Uh, so let, let me give just one small example or illustration of what might be problematic with the commission. Uh, the commission that is, is designated by the existing form of H.R. 40. So there are supposed to be 13 commissioners, and there's a division in terms of who appoints these commissioners. Three of them are supposed to be appointed by the president of the United States. Now, uh, I don't know of any current or recent president of the United States who I would be confident about <laughs> appointing commissioners to this particular commission. Okay, so <laughs> I think, I, yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm obviously including the previous president of the United States as well, okay, who was opposed to reparations, okay, so, so I think it's, it's really problematic that that's one of the set of appointment, of, of one, one, that that's one person who has authority over appointing some of the commissioners. Another uh, appointee is supposed to be made by the president pro tempore of the United States Senate. Now, keep in mind that the president pro tempore is a member of the majority party. Mitch McConnell. And currently it is Chuck Grassley from oh, Iowa. Chuck Grassley, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now we've, we've lost four slots already, right? <laughs> uh, and so I think that this is, this is a serious problem that we have to rethink the way in which this commission is going to be structured and designed. But my thing, doctor, and, and your point's well taken, <laughs> Sandy, my thing is I can't understand how people can be against a commission to take a look at an idea for a thing that we know occurs that has that has hampered black people to say you don't support H.R. 40 uh, is to say you don't believe that there should even be a look at this. That yeah. we should even yeah. study it, and, that, and that, our government is, studies all amazing. types of. We study all types of stuff, Doctor. As That's I'm right. sure you're aware, we study the, the mating of the earthworm. We study, <laughs> you know, we study what happens when a when you bury a, a piece of wood under the ground. I mean, we have these studies that people don't know anything about. These pork barrel projects, these projects that go on and on throughout our government for all types yeah. of things, and to think that there are people who are against and 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 you just mentioned. That even Barack Obama was against reparations. Even the study, a commission to study the idea of reparations. Yeah, no, and and, and that's that is that is stunning. But I guess it's indicative of the type of society we live in. You know? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and and I would say um, that there's another reason to think that a commission of this sort would be of value, particularly if they generated a quality report. Okay, and and I think around 2000, uh, a survey was done that established that about four percent of white Americans were in favor of black reparations. Okay, four percent. Okay, that means 96 <laughs> percent. Today, the 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 best estimates I've seen is about 20 percent of white Americans are actually in favor of reparations for black Americans. It's not a huge percentage, but it's certainly different from four percent. It's five and times it better. Yeah, it's, it suggests that the uh, it suggests that the derivative is moving in the right direction, perhaps. Uh, 
I would argue that if you had a high quality report from a congressionally designated commission that included a detailed exposition as to why reparations is the right thing to do, that that could increase the amount of support for reparations across the American population. And so that's another reason why I think that the commission is something that is potentially of value uh, and is, is something more than just a delaying tactic. Uh, and in fact, one way you could prevent it from being a delaying tactic is by establishing clear and precise deadlines for the commission to deliver its report. So, you know, I've, I've been thinking maybe it's 18 months from the onset of the commission. So at that point, there should be a report that would also provide Congress with a detailed legislative plan that could be put into place. And so, uh, so, so I see the, the, the possibilities for this commission, if it's done correctly, uh, as being extremely helpful in terms of furthering the, uh, the momentum towards a reparations program. 